Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this, uh, what I think will be a quite interesting presentation and education for all of us. This is one of my favorite series is what we call California Fractional Gold Coins. Uh, and, and we have joining us uh, one of the leading experts in the country, a uh, man who uh, edited the latest version of what we call the reference book called the Breen Gilio book, uh, Bob Leonard. And also joining us today is the son of the consigner, uh, the late uh, William O'Connor, who put together uh, one of the finest collections, most comprehensive collections of what we call period one California gold coins, Matt Connor. Thank you for joining us, Matt, and sharing. Good to be here. Thank you. Great. Well, let's, let's start out with you, Bob. Um, you know, these are pretty small, small items compared to regular U.S. coins. Can you tell us uh, what really, what, what are these California uh, fractional gold pieces and why were they made? Well, during the gold rush, everybody got rich. Uh, people came to California from everywhere and everybody had money except for inexpensive things like a newspaper, a boot blacking. Uh, so what, and there was a complete, almost a complete shortage of small change, hardly any U.S. silver coins. Foreign silver coins passed uh, based on size. If they were about the size of a quarter dollar, they passed as a quarter dollar, even though they might be worth 20%, uh, 25 or even 27% less than that. But people didn't care because they were wealthy. Uh, so there was a big shortage. Silver coins saw, uh, sold for a premium. If you look at the newspapers, you find ads from brokers offering to buy Mexican dollars at a premium over face value. The other currency was gold dust. Of course, the miners all had gold dust. They carried it in pokes. You went to buy something. They, everybody had a scale, you weighed out the gold dust. But for very small purchases, 25 cents, 50 cents, it's very hard to weigh out such a small amount of dust. And so in 1852, a jeweler came up with the idea of making half dollars out of gold. And this was copied fairly quickly by other jewelers. And the next year in 1853, gold dollars and even quarter dollars of gold were made. And they, uh, they were accepted at first, they had pretty close to the um, intrinsic value. There may be 80% of intrinsic value. And fairly quickly they were uh, reduced in weight, but still uh, not that much. And they circulated until about 1856, 57, when the U.S. Mint at San Francisco had established and had uh, admitted enough small coins and the um, Australian gold rush had started and, and uh, commerce had become uh, more, more normal, more like the East. So these were made to, to circulate for money during the gold rush? Uh, because I, I remember growing up in the industry and, uh, you know, I have an affinity to what we call private gold coinage coins that were made to circulate when it was tough to, as you pointed out, to use the gold dust and change. But those were mainly made by private mints, not, not jewelers necessarily, but, and, and they were like five, mainly five and 10 and $20, even two and a half, in some cases, gold pieces. Were, were these, um, and, and you said these started, those started in 18, late 1848, 1849. And, and you said this didn't, these coins didn't start to 1852. Did they actually 
uh, circulate? And uh, because I, I remember there was a, a thought that they weren't circulating at the time, but that, that thought has changed, right? Yes, um, there was discussion on this because eventually they became pure souvenirs. After 1859, there's no question but what they were uh, charms and um, novelties, uh, just California souvenirs. People go to California and they buy one for face value, but those have very much less gold value. In 1852, they're around uh, 80% initially of gold value. Um, they, uh, they definitely circulated, in my opinion, in 1852 and 1853, uh, based on newspaper accounts, um, uh, memoirs, uh, letters of the time, and so on. There's very little doubt that they did see some circulation then, although they still were, to some extent, novelties because the miners would buy them to mail back to relatives in the East because they're so little you could put them in an envelope. Uh, and you know, fold your letter around him, and it would it would go through. So that's how we know that they actually circulated at the time, and then uh, weren't a few found on shipwrecks. Yes, thanks for mentioning that. Uh, there are two shipwrecks that are um, helpful in this. The Winfield Scott sank in 1853, uh, and the Winfield Scott had a lot of uh, small California gold coins. Um, one of the early dealers, in fact, the leading collector uh, of the time, Ken Lee, um, since he was a leading dealer, he was offered coins that came from the Winfield Scott, but he wasn't much of a scholar, but I wrote him and I asked him, what coins were you offered? And he replied, so I have a list and I, I shared this with uh, Dave Bowers, and it's in his um, American Coin Treasures and Hordes book, the first edition, of the, um, uh, the small California gold coins that were found in the wreck of the Winfield Scott in 1853. Then we have the wreck of the Central America in 1857, which bookends the other end of this. And the Central America actually was um, a sale from Panama, but the passengers had started out in San Francisco and crossed the isthmus. Um, and uh, over a hundred pieces of small California gold coins have been found in the wreck of the Central America. So there's little doubt that they were made at the time and used at the time. You mentioned um, Ken Lee. Uh, I knew Ken and, and, and another dealer collector uh, Jay Rowe. Uh, they, they both put together pretty substantial collections, but there was another man by the name of William O'Connor uh, who also put together a, a pretty comprehensive collection. I, I don't think he was a dealer though, so he probably didn't have as much access. Matt, can you share with us uh, some of your first memories of when your father we got started collecting uh, these uh, little fractional gold pieces? Yeah, well, absolutely, Don. Um, my father was a, a typical coin collector, um, traveled throughout the Midwest going to various coin shows, and he came across his first piece uh, at one of these shows and became entranced by them. And he learned about them, heard the stories that, you know, that Bob had, had just shared. In fact, my dad uh, kind of put his own little spin on how the, the coins were used back in the day and that there was, uh, there was a belief that uh, due to the lack of currency, you know, things were done in pinches of gold. And the, the bartenders always had the biggest thumbs, you know? And so there was an inequities that were going on. And so they needed these coins and the jewelers uh, uh, made them. And, and so it, it started with this very first coin, uh, coin show that uh, he, he went to and then uh, continued to expand uh, and going to multiple coin shows and, and 
just trying to find another piece. He was a period one collector and he wanted to have them all by using the, the uh, Ken Lee book, you know, there was a, a, a finite number of them and his, his goal was to, uh, to collect them all. He knew that wasn't possible, but he loved the hunt. He loved the chase. And he, at, at, at the beginning, he was very successful in finding more and more pieces. And, and in some cases, the dealers really didn't know what they were. They were oftentimes just in boxes of loose coins and he'd rummage through and pick one up and how much do you want for this one? And, and, and as the collection continued to grow and grow and the rarity continued to get higher and higher, the coin shows were not as effective in finding, finding gold, uh, California fractional gold. So he then turned to auctions, right? And he got into the auction space. Uh, and he would get so excited about a possible uh, piece that he didn't have that was available. And, and uh, you'd be anxious for days waiting for this auction to occur. Obviously this was pre-internet, right? So he would have to submit uh, a price in, or in some cases actually be on the phone when the auction's going on. But uh, he'd be anxious and he'd be thinking strategy and how am I gonna get this piece? And it was all very fun. And uh, the chase was uh, the thing that he enjoyed. And, uh, and, and he collected a, an enormous uh, collection, which he was very proud of. So uh, it was uh, a 20 year period of his life uh, that he, he really had a lot of fun with and enjoyed a great deal. It sounds that way. Now, you mentioned period one. Uh, Bob, you, you wrote, um, you know, he, and you mentioned the Ken Lee book that he used, uh, one of the first ones. Another guy named Doreen had a book that came out. Yeah. But the one that we've used for decades now uh, is called the Breen Gilio book. And uh, uh, Bob is showing us uh, the uh, the cover of one. Uh, Bob, you you were did the latest edition. You were the editor. Tell us tell us how there, there's an inor inordinate amount of different varieties, and uh, evidently we're still finding new varieties. But uh, tell us about that, and and what defines a period one versus the other periods. Okay, the period, there's three periods. And the periods were assigned by Walter Breen. Uh, this is called the Breen Gilio book and rightfully so because Walter Breen uh, basically wrote with the assistance of Ron Gilio, the first edition. Uh, the book I held up is the second edition. And the second edition is the book that Bill O'Connor contributed to, uh, two of Bill O'Connor's coins were lacking in the J. Rowe collection. We used the J. Rowe collection, which at that time was the largest for the illustrations, but J. was missing these two coins, but Bill generously loaned them to us for photography and they are plate coins in the book. And he also read the manuscript for period one, um, his specialty, uh, and made important comments which are incorporated in the book. Now, the, what Walter Breen divided the, uh, the California fractional gold into three periods. The first period, 1852 to 1856, he called it, although I adjusted to 1857, um, was the period when they circulated as money, in his opinion. And toward the end of this period, they uh, it, it was not a sudden, it was not sudden that, you know, one day they're money, the next day they're, they're junk. Uh, but they, but during that period, they had monetary use, certainly. And then in 1859 to 1882, that's period two, as he defined it, that is the period when they were reintroduced by jewelers and a, and a couple of the same jewelers, actually, but much thinner and lighter, purely as charms and souvenirs. Um, and then period three was after 1882, 
and that was um, imitations and counterfeits. I, I, I know that the uh, Professional Coin Grading Service, uh, PCGS, uh, has what they call registry sets, and, and, and so does uh, NGC, um, where people can compete to put together the finest, uh, uh, most complete collection of any series. And, and I, 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 I think the last time I checked, uh, they said they, they, they've recognized, I think, 142 different varieties or 140, 141 different varieties of period ones. So, so since they are the ones that did circulate pretty much with the gold period and, and have the most intrinsic, those, of course, are the ones that are most sought after. Um, and, and then I guess there's hundreds of the, uh, of the period twos. Um, uh, uh, do they all look the same, uh, Bob? No, the, the difference you can really tell almost by the edge. The period one pieces are thick and the round ones typically have reeded edges. So they the come round, ones, they come round and octagonal. They come right? round and octagonal. Now the, uh, as you know, the pioneer gold coins themselves, uh, they were all round except for the $50 pieces. Uh, which were technically ingots, were made octagonal. So you had in, in Gold Rush, California, you had round coins and octagonal coins circulating. And the jewelers uh, copied that. The very first ones, 1852, are round. Later octagonal pieces were added. Now, but the, uh, the image on the obverse and reverse, they're not all the same, like Liberty had uh, U.S. federal coins, right? Oh, they, um, they're copied from U.S. gold coins, of course. I mean, the, the half dollar, the original half dollar 1852 looks like a U.S. gold dollar 1852, except it's smaller. Uh, and it says California gold. It doesn't say United States of America. Um, some of the other are some innovative ones. There's a one variety, of 1853 half dollar that has the arms of California, mm -hmm. arms of the state of California on it. And the highlight of this sale, in my opinion, is the quarter dollar of 1854, which has a defiant eagle on it. Uh, 25 cents, actually, it says. Yeah. But otherwise, they are... Uh, they have liberty heads. In this uh -huh. period two, you get heads of George Washington and uh, Indian heads. So Matt, you, you shared with us that uh, Bill uh, tried to, like so many, uh, form a complete collection. Mm -hmm. But was there anything, uh, any particular items like maybe the Defiant Eagle or Arms of Cal that, that California, that, that Bill, might have pointed out to you that was of particular interest to him? Oh, most definitely the eagles were, you know, the coins to have and to, to and he really enjoyed uh, uh, those in particular. He was an admirer of these coins as well as a collector. And uh, it was not uncommon for her, you know, for him to sit down after a day's work and pull out some coins and, and get his, you know, his magnifying glass and, you know, look at it. And, hey, Matt, come on over here. You know, count the berries on the on the back. How many, <laughs> how many there are? Is, yeah. is, is it twelve or thirteen? You know, and yeah. and yeah, you know, because it makes a difference in the variety. So yeah, he he. Uh, I, but I would to answer your question, it was the eagles. The eagles, yeah. yeah, yeah. It it takes a magnifying glass, even you know, even when you're young, to 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 distinguish some of the different varieties. There's so so many, uh, yeah, and a tremendous undertaking, especially back in those days before the internet and and you having to go to coin shows and the fact that he wasn't a dealer, uh, and he had to rely on going to coin shows or dealers finding him uh, right. uh, pieces. Uh, 
did he uh, was he always trying to collect the finest, or he, he was looking for more for completeness, or or did he share that with you? He was looking uh, for completeness of the collection, and uh, he did upgrade um, when he had the opportunity opportunity to do that. But it was more about um, having one of everything. He he had no interest in having multiples of the same variety. Um, so it was really about getting that full collection. And, and how, how well did he do, Bob, compared to other collections over, uh, historically? Tell us, uh... Well, this is one of the very best. Now, there's a few pieces that are unique, so it's a little difficult to make a comparison. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, uh, there's two unique ones in here. He, he was, he's lacking the, uh, maybe the most expensive of all the GG dollar uh, that J. Rowe paid $100,000 for. But, I remember uh, that. Yes, oh. and um, yes, they saw him coming, I'm afraid, and it didn't bring, it didn't bring too close to that at auction. It, it brought in five figures, but not, not a, nowhere near what he paid. Um, but, uh, the Jack Tathro collection was about the same size. Now, Jack Tathro had one that was also unique, obviously lacking in O'Connor, but Bill O'Connor had two that were lacking in, um, since they're unique, they were lacking in the Tathro collection. It's a little difficult to make a comparison. So uh, I, but a I, very, very complete collection. Uh, having, uh, I know you you cataloged the, uh, the Tathro collection because because we, we're the ones that sold it. Um, and I did a comparison myself, and uh, there's actually more uh, major varieties in the O'Connor collection than in the Tothero collection, and only Jack Lee or J. Rowe had a more complete collection as far as a number of different varieties. Mm -hmm. uh, Jack Tothero had some what we might call minor varieties because um, maybe it was a different uh, die setting or, or whatever for a uh, minor varieties, as we would call, he, he had some different die states and that, that gets pretty uh, more, more, uh, are, uh, even harder to, to discern, but Bill, um, uh, Bill's collection, I believe is, uh, the second uh, most complete one, uh, that's been sold at least publicly. Um, uh, tell me more, uh, some other highlights, uh, if you would, uh, uh, about the collection and what are your favorite ones, Bob? Uh, well, my favorite is clearly uh, BG-220, the Defiant Eagle. BG and meaning Breen Gilio. Okay. BG, that. yeah. Mean, I'm sorry. That's Breen Gilio. Uh-huh. Green Gilio are the catalogers. Uh, well, they're the authors of the first edition. I wrote the second edition. Um, 220 is their, is uh, Breen's um, assigned number to this. And while not unique, that is a very rare coin. Uh, it was, it's the last major variety to be discovered. It was unknown until 1909 when two of them showed up in the, um, Andrew Zabriskie collection auctioned by Henry Kohlau, um, Chapman, Henry Chapman. And it was unknown until then. However, uh, it turned out that there was one in the University of Pennsylvania collection that had been donated actually 1898 by, in 1898, collected earlier. And Zabriskie purchased the coin collection, the California coin collection of Augustus Humbert, who was assayer of gold and who made the $50 slugs among other coins. And he was a collector himself. And so, and he was active in 1854 in San Francisco. So very likely he acquired um, these Defiant Eagle pieces from the maker uh, maybe not in 1854, perhaps they decided not to put them in circulation and Zabriskie acquired them. And then, um, so we don't know how many were made exactly, but it's in single digits. 
It's uh, no questions in single digits. Maybe found six, seven. We don't know. Yes, I, that's I my think favorite. That's my favorite, really. And actually, on the arms of California, I've been kind of concerned about whether that was really made in 1853 or not. Well, that's I'm a little that, worried about it. That that'll be a, a discussion in the future, I'm sure. But I think that Defiant Eagle. Uh, yes, I think that appeals to to a lot of people. We're we're gonna wrap up soon, and but I, I want to ask Matt uh, to conclude with. Tell me, what what kind of lessons did you learn that from your father's experience that you'd like to share with the rest of us? He he studied the coins. He he researched the coins. He put a lot of energy in trying to understand the history that, that Bob has been sharing, and. And I think uh, that has translated to me in terms of just being very well prepared, you know, and, and to research whatever the subject is well, know it well, be an expert, work hard at it. And, uh, and those, those were the attributes that, that translated to me. I think those are very good lessons for all of us in the field. I, uh, Matt, I want to thank you for sharing that experience with us. Bob, for your expertise. Uh, we're going to wrap it up now. Uh, and, and thank you all for participating. We will be starting the sale of the uh, William O'Connor collection uh, at uh, eight o'clock tonight, Friday, uh, Thursday night, uh, March 11th. Thank you all, and uh, good luck to those who are bidding.